After having been gone for a few weeks and just got him, gotten back last week, it's good. I feel like I've been slingshot into this like next study that we're looking at. We're looking, we're walking through the book of 1 Corinthians, which is quite a road trip in and of itself through the Bible. There's a lot of challenges. It's written to an interesting culture. A lot of things we need to try to understand. And last week we did our best to kind of step into the world of what life was like in ancient Corinth maybe in some ways similar, but in many ways different from today. And what I want to do throughout this study is just give you not just my insights, but things that I've learned um, through study and through interacting with a lot of other people, doing a lot of reading of what people, how people are interpreting and understanding this book. Um, this is not the authoritative interpretation of everything, my words. I mean, please use this as a springboard, ask your own questions, do your own study and research. Um, I'm just giving you the best angle I have, but it's not going to be a perfect one, and I guarantee you that I'll walk away from this book still having unanswered questions, as I'm sure you might as well. So, uh, but it'll be a good, good trip for us, I think. And today we're kind of jumping into the actual letter, um, because 1 Corinthians is a letter from the Apostle Paul to a church uh, he spent almost two years with personally, and then after a couple years of being away, uh, they communicated some issues that were happening and some questions that they had, and through a series of different letters, uh, we have some of that correspondence. But like with any letter, it's a one-sided thing. We don't have the questions they ask. We don't have their side of the conversation. So we're just doing the best we can to figure out the scenarios and what's going on based on what the Apostle Paul writes in this letter that we do have. It's included in Scripture. Um, Paul and God through his wisdom speaking into their situations, what they're dealing with. And we're going to try to take that and get some principles and things that we can use in our own culture. As we look at this book, I think what we're going to see as a thread throughout everything is this idea of honoring and humility. And as people, we, we tend to either consciously or subconsciously really like to be honored and looked up to and respected and sometimes even viewed as better than other people. And with the way of Jesus, the way that he operates, it's really, a lot of it revolves around humility. And so we're going to see Paul over and over again speaking into the culture of early Corinth. Well, I say ancient Corinth. Corinth was around a while before the Romans came into it and before the first century when Paul's writing to the believers there. But at this point in time, in the first century, he's going to be challenging a lot of aspects of their culture. And he's using Jesus' cross and the humility of that experience and what we learn about God from that experience to speak to a lot of different issues that they're trying to navigate. And so this morning we'll actually look at <clears throat> the cross toward the end and how that is such a powerful uh, symbol, and not only symbol, but it, it just is very relevant for trying to live the Christian life. It sets a great example of what Jesus' life and mission and ministry is really about, but it's very opposite to the way that people tend to think and operate. So we're going to see that fleshed out. As we get into this, I want to start off by reading the prayer. It's in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 4 through 9. Um, I'll work into that here as well. I've got a little thing to advance our slides today, but I think. <clears throat> Let's see. <laughs> this is like continual, continual technology challenges. Everything worked well last week, so we'll see what happens today. Is it advancing on there? Can you advance it on the, the keyboard? Okay, yeah. I don't know why it's got a new battery and everything, so we should be good to go, but we are not. So anyway, this is Paul's prayer of thanksgiving. And I feel like understanding this, two things. One is it was ancient custom to begin your letters after your greeting with a prayer of thanksgiving. Most people would write it to some like Roman or Greek deity, right? A god or goddess. But Paul, because he believes Jesus and the God of the Bible, you know, is the creator God, um, he is going to be offering this prayer of thanksgiving with a Bible-centered, God-centered slant on it. All right, now we're in business. It works. So he says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace, the favor, the kindness of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, in that everything you were enriched in him and Jesus in all speech and in all knowledge, just as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed or established in you, so you're not lacking in any gift as you eagerly await the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, I have fond remembrances of you. I'm thankful that you excel in all of these different areas of being gifted by God to be effective as a church. You don't lack anything. 
And God is establishing you, and he'll continue establishing you until the end. So he's very confident that God's going to continue working in these Jesus followers' lives. Uh, And then he says, unaccused on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when he prays, he realizes someday these believers will stand before God, unaccused in God's sight, blameless, um, because of their faith in Christ. Um, And so he sees the way they will be. But the way that they are right now is probably anything but blameless. There's a lot of areas that they have to work on and to improve. And my hope is that we don't just see the flaws in the early Corinthian church as we walk through this letter, you know, and also the hope that, that God is completing a process in them, right? They're growing as well, and we're all in this growth process. But my hope is that we'll be able to look at ourselves and say, like, how do we need, how do we need growth and improvement um, and maybe true spirituality as well, not just looking at the Corinthians and being judgmental of them? But he says, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So ultimately, God has started this work in all of us who are following Jesus with our lives, and he's going to keep working. He's going to keep transforming us step by step. Um, he hasn't given up, and he's got a purpose. And he has a purpose for the Corinthian followers of Jesus as well. Um, what we're walking into today, though, um, gets into a bit of competition. Uh, there's a competition happening in this early church. Um, and I don't know if you feel a competitive sense when you walk in here this morning. Hopefully you didn't. But if you walked into this point in church in this point in Corinth, you might feel that there was a competition going on, and people were taking a lot of different sides. He says in verse uh, 10, Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you. That word divisions, it's like it's tears, literally, because Paul's using this to set up an illustration with fabric, because he uses the word mending in just a moment. He says, But that you may be made complete or permanently mended in the same mind and the same judgment same type of reasoning. So he's saying, basically, right now, your church is like, it it was a piece of fabric, and over time, there have been some tears that have developed in it. There's some relational rifts and tears. And his prayer is that this church gets mended, that those rifts between people get patched up and sewn together so that they can be on a similar page as far as the way that they think, as far as the way that they're unified in the way that they love. Now, that brings up a good question. Are we ever all going to think the same way in this room? Not a chance, right? But there are some core things. uh, Jesus' perspective on what life is really about, and maybe our perspective on God and who Christ is, that unite us. And so there's some core, big-picture things that if the Corinthians will be aware of that, and a lot of it is illustrated through the cross, the way that we're supposed to approach each other in in humility. And that way of approaching people in humility and thinking that way is a large part of what Paul's talking about that will sew them back together into one piece of fabric. So it's not necessarily what they think about a very, very specific idea about Christ or Christianity. It's this overarching attitude of love and humility. And if they can wrap their minds around that, uh, they'll be transformed and their relationships will improve within their church. And so I want to pose a question to us to consider as we work through this, as we work through the book, because we're going to encounter several different ways that the Corinthians need to adjust their thinking in order to be able to be more unified together. Instead of so competitive, we learned last week that their society, a lot of people are trying to get ahead and climb the social ladder and gain more honor and more wealth and more status and more positions of government or or, uh, things in the community to be looked up up to. And so there's this driving force in, the, in the, the culture. And so just as they need to shift some of their thinking because the culture is pushing them to think in one way, maybe there are ways that we as a church need to shift the way that we're thinking because our culture, whether we realize it or not, it's pushing us to think in certain ways. And some of those ways might not be in line with what Jesus and his very, very humble, humiliating death on the cross sets for us as a trajectory as Christians. And so we're going to hopefully be confronted with some of the ways that we think and be challenged in that. He's going to talk about the very first situation he's concerned about in the next verse, um, and that's verse 11. Um, What he says is, I have been informed concerning you, my brothers and sisters. Let me pop up to this one. I have been informed concerning... 
informed concerning you, my brothers and sisters, by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you. So we think, okay, a few people are arguing. But it's more than that. Um, Paul's going to describe in the next verse what it is. But what's happening is there are rivalries, and it's because of affiliation. Certain people sitting out in this church family in Corinth, they're affiliating or associating themselves with one particular, in this case, church leader. And then other people are saying, nope, nope, I'm a part of that church leader's group. And so they're allying with different leaders, in this case, in their church. Because the way that you get ahead in society in Corinth is you build connections with people. And I mean, that could be the same in our society too, right? If you want to advance in a company or in business or in a community, you build connections and those connections have connections and you kind of, you know, work your way up into a better standing. And that's the way it was in ancient Corinth. And so they're thinking, if it works for us in society, it's probably a great plan for us in the church. The only problem with that is Jesus... Jesus normally operates in a way that's about 180 degrees uh, different than society in the way that people are supposed to interact and love and relate in a church. So they're importing society in that way of doing things, and there's arguments and divisions that are cropping up because of that. Also, here's another comment. Just because in a church there aren't arguments and divisions, like maybe you came in this morning, I don't know how many arguments you heard this morning, I didn't hear any. <laughs> Maybe that won't always be your experience here in other churches, but I didn't hear very many people arguing out in the entryway. But that doesn't mean that there's no division. Because sometimes there are divisions over things, and people just realize arguing is pointless. But they still have their preferences and their categories. And they still, as this church does, view themselves maybe as even more spiritual because of their affiliations and who they're affiliated with. Um, in verse 12, um, Paul says this, Now I mean this, um, that each one of you is saying, I'm with Paul, or I'm with Apollos, or I'm with Cephas, which is the Aramaic name for Peter, the Apostle Peter, or I'm with Christ. And this I am with, this is political language in the first century. If you wanted to ally yourself with a first century politician, you'd say, I am with Cicero. I don't know, pick your name. I am with that person. And so this church is speaking as if they have drawn up political lines, in a sense, of different leaders. Everybody's siding with the leader that they perceive to be the most spiritual leader. So what did they think determined a spiritual leader? What do you think? I mean, I guess that would be a question for us to entertain, too. What makes somebody spiritual, right? Right? And I think based on what we see in the rest of the book, here's a few of my thoughts. I think for the Corinthians, they're still working this out, but here are some of the things that they think make someone spiritual. Holding a religious office or having religious connections. Paul was an apostle, so some people sided with him. Peter was an apostle who had actually spent time face-to-face -face with Jesus for over three years. And so that might get some people a little bit higher status. They'd say, well, I follow an apostle. He had a religious position and still does, but he actually walked with Jesus face-to-face, -face, so he's even more spiritual. Um, some people said it's spiritual gifts. And Paul talks about how he practiced all these spiritual gifts, even more than the Corinthians. So that would be another reason to jump on the Team Paul bandwagon. Then other people said, no, in our culture, it's rhetorical skills, your ability to argue and persuade and debate in public and have polished speech. That's what makes you of high status. And so they said, well, surely somebody spiritual that can do that. And Apollos, he's a person who came in after Paul had moved out of that church for another period, a shorter period of time. And he was very eloquent. He was from Alexandria, Egypt, one of the most uh, educated communities in the ancient world at that time, had a huge library there. He was very effective at public speech and, speech and debate and very bold. And so some people said, well, Apollos, he is the, he's the epitome of a, you know, a Greek um, order. So I'm, I'm with him. Like That's going to make me more spiritual because I think that makes somebody more spiritual. Other people, I think, were looking at personality. And some of these different figures that we discussed, you know, had different personality traits. Paul was a little rough around the edge, and so that was a good reason for people not to jump on Team Paul in this case. Family heritage, wealth was certainly a part of it. Uh, the number of disciples, somebody's social status. Uh, we know Paul was a Roman citizen. Peter was probably not. 
um, knowledge and wisdom, um, who baptized them. These are the things that they're thinking make someone spiritual in their eyes. And so, what do you think makes somebody spiritual? Maybe you have some of the same ideas. Maybe your ideas are different. But we're supposed to entertain this question as we walk through this story. What does it mean to be spiritual? You know. And then, what does Jesus think determines a person's spirituality? Maybe that's even a better question to ask, right? And it's not the same things that the Corinthians believe determines someone's spirituality. Um, Let's see, I want to take you through this. Um, Everyone in the church is siding with the leader whom they perceive to be the most spiritual, but why? Why are they doing this? Again, because they think that having the best connections in church will increase their spiritual status, just like having the best connections in society increases their social status. And again, the assumption is God defines spirituality and success and status the same way that our culture does. They're trying to climb this ladder. They think those best connections are going to benefit them. But the problem is, As they climb this ladder, they climb further and further away from Jesus' way. When Jesus talks about spiritual status, spirituality, what does he say about it? We have a little window in Matthew 20. This is when some of Jesus' disciples are arguing about who's better and who should get the higher position of power in his kingdom. And he says, all right, guys, come on over. We need to have a talk, family meeting. He says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles, these other nations, um, they domineer over them. Like it's all about status and power and control. And those in high positions exercise authority over them, but it's not this way among you. But whoever wants to become prominent among you, I think we could sub the word spiritual for prominent, shall be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you shall be your slave. And then he says, just as the Son of Man, a name he used to describe himself, and then it connects with the Old Testament also, did not come to be served, but to serve. And then he adds this on, to give his life as a ransom for many. And if we know how that story turned out, that was Jesus' death on the cross. So he takes them to the cross at that point and says, you think spirituality is about status and power and decision making and who stands out in the crowd and who speaks better and who's more gifted? It's really about who's the bigger servant. And if you're everyone's slave, then you've really arrived. You've got it. You understand. Just like I'm going to show you when I go to the cross and I become everyone's slave and I lower myself beyond what you would ever imagine. Like this is what true power is. It's servanthood. It's being slave of all. And so you have this this huge contrast. And unfortunately, because people are taking sides in the church of Corinth, they're causing relational rifts um, and they're creating categories of spiritual superiority and inferiority. I'm more spiritual because I follow Paul. Like, he's my teacher. No, 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 no. I follow Apollos. He's a much better speaker. He's more convincing. I'm more spiritual because I can see that. You know, I can see who's the real spiritual person here. Or, you know, I follow Jesus, trump card, right? I don't follow any of these guys. I follow Jesus. I'm more spiritual than you are because if you were, you would follow Jesus too. Um, And so I want us to think for a moment, I want us to make it personal, but what kind of categories of superiority and inferiority might we be bringing from our social context around us into our church here, Mountain View Bible Church? If you're listening online, you attend church elsewhere, think of your local church. What groups might we be identifying with to gain honor? And I think sometimes it's consciously, but a lot of times for us it's subconsciously. We don't even realize why we're doing the things that we're doing. Or what groups might we be implying that we are more spiritual than? Who or what are we consistently voicing our preferences for? You know, well, I prefer this in church. Or our convictions about or against. You know, well, I really think that that was inappropriate because here's where my convictions lie. And if really... If someone else knew, they would agree. They would feel the same way. You know, I am spiritually enlightened. They are a little bit lesser than. What kinds of categories do we create? 
There could be a long list, but here's some, here's some possibilities. I'm not saying this is the case, but I'm saying these are things that we tend to import from society into the church and make categories and, and you know, deep, deep down inside feel like I'm a little more spiritual than they are because here's the group that I'm affiliated with. Exactly what was happening in the church in Corinth. Here's some possibilities. I'm with Team Jason. He's the pastor here. I want him to teach. It's kind of annoying when other people teach. I like to hear from him. Other people, I'm with Team Kevin. Kevin is a snowbird. He's here half the year uh, from uh, Montana, and he teaches totally differently than I do. He uses PowerPoint, and some people are like, I just love the way Kevin teaches. Every year they come up to me, and they're like, are you going to have him teach next year when he's here? I'm like, probably. I just love the way Kevin teaches. And then other people say, well, I like Carly. She spoke a few weeks ago when Jason was out of town, and you know, it's refreshing to hear from a woman, hear a woman's perspective, and she's so like academic. And then other people say, well, I'm, I'm with Team John. John Wolf is here. You're going to hear from him in a couple weeks. So if you're on Team John right now, again, we're going to confront that <laughs> deep inside. But, but you will get, you'll, you'll get your way in a couple of weeks, I guess. But he teaches these very in-depth book discussion groups. He's a philosophy professor, local university, and teaches from time to time. And he just has a totally different perspective. He thinks so much more deeply and differently than I do. Like, we're all so different. And because of that, maybe you have an idea that, you know, one of these people is a little more spiritual and you have a preference, but maybe not just the preference, you vocalize it and, you know, maybe even put other people down because of your preference. This is where things get dangerous. I think it's where the church in Corinth started to slide. Uh, maybe it's this, maybe it's politics, right? Because there's an election coming up in what, just a couple months, a little over a couple months. And maybe you think, well, you know, Anybody who's a Christian would vote for Donald Trump. I just can't see why somebody wouldn't. Or anybody, you actually would have people say, anybody who's a Christian should vote for Kamala, right? And so I'm more spiritual because I'm thinking about social issues or I'm thinking about economic issues or I am for this candidate. And then you have other people who would say, I just want anyone else. I don't care who they are. I will vote for anyone else. Like, I'm done. And then you would have people that say, I'm not going to vote because I don't think any candidate fully represents Jesus. I'm on team Jesus. And if you come in to a church environment and you bring your support of a political candidate in and you're vocal about it to the extent that you start lifting that person up and, you know, kind of uh, inherently by focusing on one, you know, it's so hard not to make comments against another. The problem is you start having other people in the church who vote differently. And so you're bringing a societal idea about what is more honorable and which candidate is more honorable into a church setting. And you're dividing people in a church and almost claiming to be more spiritual. Again, not intentionally, subconsciously, because you're promoting this person so much politically. Right. And that's what it was in Corinth with a teacher. But there was a political slant on it. Right. Um, that's what society does. I'm not saying it's wrong to have political opinions or to vote different ways, but when it starts becoming a side that you take in a church setting, it causes division. Here's another one. Um, lots of different ideas in churches about alcohol. So you might have team drink responsibly and team prohibition. Don't touch it, right? Because of a lot of different reasons. And some people have a past with alcoholism, and it's wise for them to be on team prohibition, right? And other people, they want to focus on freedom. And some people have been taught in churches, I certainly was raised this way, that drinking alcohol is a sin, which you don't find in the Bible. In fact, very, I would say almost certain that Jesus drank alcohol with wine, uh, with the wine consumption. And so, um, you start to have people line up, and the idea is if you are more spiritual, you would have a certain opinion. And so when we bring those kinds of things out in the church, it gets dangerous, it causes sides. Again, fine to have those opinions, but when you start promoting it and almost putting down someone who thinks differently, it causes problems. Team always armed and team gun control in this part of the country. Like you have a lot of opinions, but again, um, we take our cultural. Uh, opinions and preferences and platforms and we try to bring them into a church and the idea is you're more spiritual if you line up here and there's a danger because what if you don't line up here if you think differently are you looked down on for having a conversation that says well actually you know I'm in the minority here on whatever issue it is team clean eating or team processed food um, 
I'm more spiritual because I take care of my body, right? Or I'm more spiritual because I have the freedom to eat whatever I want. And some people feel like, well, you know, we're all going to die anyway and we're going somewhere. But, and other people will say, well, you know, well, this body's going to be resurrected, so you better take care of it, <laughs> you know? I mean, so many, but, but it gets attached to more spirituality, right? It can be. Team nest egg, team paycheck to paycheck. You know, I invested my money wisely. I work hard. I have a little better paying job. And secretly deep within, I look down on people who live paycheck to paycheck and think they haven't been applying Dave Ramsey's financial principles or something like that. Like, and of course, that's more spiritual. I'm more spiritual because I have money in the bank. Is that the cross? I think Jesus would say no. Like, this is way, this is cultural, but you're feeling better about yourselves because of this. Team corporal punishment versus team gentle parents, right? I am, I am secretly better than they are because I have this opinion and this preference for parenting, and, and it's, it's more effective. I'm not going to tell them, or maybe I will, just kind of like passively, aggressively, <laughs> that it's more effective. But um, this is the way I feel, but we attach it to spirituality. Team homeschool, team public school, I am more spiritual secretly deep down inside because I educate my children in different ways. It could be our dress, the way we come dressed to church. I certainly grew up, I grew up in a church that ticked off a lot of these boxes, by the way. Uh, it was another part of the country, and, and you know, I, I have very different ways of thinking currently because of my experience. But there, uh, you definitely were more spiritual if you came to church every single week dressed in a shirt and tie than even if you wore like khakis and a polo. There were degrees of spirituality, and it was obvious by the way that you dressed, of course. Team on stage versus team behind the scenes. You know what? I'm up here in the worship band every single week, leading people in worship. I'm a little more spiritual than those people sitting in the back. Or, you know what? I don't need recognition. Those people on stage, they're prideful. I can work in the nursery where no one ever even knows I exist for years on end. <laughs> That's true spirituality. These babies, they're crying. They wear diapers. It's easy to stand up on stage and play your guitar and sing. I know where it's really at, right? <laughs> team married or team single, you know? Maybe someday God will bring them someone, and then they'll know what life is about. Because God knows when you're married and life gets tough and you have kids, like, you just, like, there were things as a single person that, like, you thought you knew, but you just didn't know. Or people who are single for years or decades think, well, you know, it's nice to have a teammate. Like, it's tough. Like, I know why it was tough for Jesus to be kind of out by himself because there's just a new dimension when you're dealing with life single or maybe you've lost a spouse due to marriage or divorce and you're navigating things and it's all falling on you. It takes true spirituality to carry that on your shoulders, you know. Team retirees versus team young families right? Like, you know, sometimes we look at people in different stages of life and we think, well, you know, someday we'll get there or I'm so glad I'm where I'm at. But we divide over things, you know, like our life stages. Team adults versus team kids. You know, those kids, they're just young. They don't know anything. Someday they'll become spiritual like I am because I'm 18 or older. And again, we would never say that. We'd never walk up to someone in a conversation and say, guess what, I'm better than you are because I support this political candidate or because I sing on stage. But maybe there's an implication deep within that we kind of are. In the way that we speak to people, in the way that we highlight certain things or in the way that we downplay other things, uh, that's, Jesus, I think, would say that's not quite lined up with the cross. Verses 13 to 16 um, Paul's, again, responding to Team Paul and Team Apollos and Team Peter and Team Christ. He says, has Christ been divided? Like, did Christ uh, get separated into different categories? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Like, Paul didn't die for you, so why are you on Team Paul? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He says, I'm thankful that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Because he knew, like, this would only make the Team Paul problem worse. But I did baptize the house of Stephanus also, and beyond that, I don't know if I baptized anyone. So he's saying, like, when a church separates into factions, 
what it really does, it, it divides the church, but it really misrepresents Jesus. It tells people around us that Jesus is divided. Like within the body of Jesus, like it's all about arguments. And it also um, discredits Jesus because it says what it's really about is, you know, leadership, baptizing a certain number of people, or, you know, you know leadership uh, having the ability to speak, or having all these spiritual gifts. It's not about Jesus. It's about these different characteristics, these human characteristics of spirituality. And it takes away from who Jesus really is. Focus this Jesus' attention on people. And that's not what the church is about. As we kind of wrap things up today, um, this is verse 17. It says, um, For Christ did not send me to baptize. So this is Paul continuing on this, this logic, this conversation. Like, he, he didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news, not with wisdom of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be emptied. So here he's coming back to the cross, and he's saying, like, what if, essentially, um, what if it was all about the number of people that, that you baptized? And who baptized you? What if that was what Christianity was about? It would take attention away from Jesus and focus it on that person who was just so convincing, you know, or so relational that they were able to baptize all these people. Then he says, not with wisdom of speech. If it was all about being persuasive and a great debater and a public speaker and an argument, you know, somebody who's good at arguments, then Christianity would revolve around these people, these figures who were just wonderful speakers. That's what it would be about. But in doing that, you actually empty out the significance of Jesus' cross, right? It's not about Jesus and what he did at the cross. It's about all these things that people do, these outward acts of spirituality. But Christ's intention was to focus our attention on the significance and the implications of the cross. And so we're going to take a look at the implications of the cross in our closing today. The cross really destroys all of our human categories of spirituality and those categories that we have to compare ourselves with each other, um, intentionally or unintentionally. Um, Verse 18, it says, For the word of the cross, the message of the cross, is foolishness to those who are perishing. And the word perishing, it's literally destroying themselves. It's in a middle tense. It's a unique voice in the Greek language. And so it's, we think of it, when we read a verse like this, our fir- the first way that our minds go oftentimes is to say, those who are perishing means people who are like eternally separated from God. But in this context, I don't think, that word may mean that other places, but in this context, I think that it, what it's talking about is um, people who are destroying themselves by making life all about themselves, by creating their own categories of spirituality, by living only for status and honor and success by getting Jesus' perspective all wrong, like they're kind of destroying themselves by seeking themselves. To those people that are on their own track and their own agenda, like the cross seems foolish, like pointless, worthless, empty. But he says to us who are being saved or rescued, maybe it's rescued from relationship apart from God, maybe it's rescued from the way that the culture drives us, right? We see the cross not as this pinnacle of humiliation, but we actually see it as a picture of God's power. So it's revolutionary because in the cross, the cross reverses human power dynamics. Everything that people think about what it means to have power and success, the cross totally flips it upside down and Jesus redefines it. And it shows what God's nature is really like. And God's kingdom and God's idea of power is really about. It's not about gaining honor and gaining status and comparing ourselves with each other and competing with each other, which the Corinthians kind of thought it was about. Instead of that, it's about something opposite. The cross is the most shameful thing. If you talk to somebody in this ancient society, if you walked up to someone in ancient Corinth and said, what's the most shameful, humiliating thing you can imagine? Scariest thing, they would say being crucified on a cross. It was like it happened to the worst of the worst criminals. It was instant way to go from status to zero status, even worse than a slave in their culture and their mindset. Crucifixion was the worst, most humbling, most shameful thing that you could ever think of to experience. So compare it to whatever you would consider to be the most shameful thing that could ever happen to you. Like that's what the cross was to them. So because it was so shameful in their mind, 
No person guided, guided by human reason alone, trying to think like, what does spirituality look like from a human perspective? Nobody would ever believe that the cross was significant. Nobody would ever believe it was God's means of rescuing humanity and showing us what true power was about. It would have been inconceivable that the cross could have had anything to do with power or spirituality. But yet it does because it redefines it. We look at the cross and we see humility, we see self-sacrifice, and we see love. And in Jesus' kingdom, that's what true power is about. Status, again, is about being the greatest servant, being slave of all. Accepting humility, sacrificing oneself for others, and love, unconditional love. And the cross nails it but society would never see it because they would never think the cross could show them anything good or beneficial. <laughs> the last thing Paul says in verse 19, he uses an illustration out of the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament to just make this point. It says, For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the understanding of those who have understanding I will confound. So Paul's still interacting with this idea of like the cross is completely against the way that people think and human reasoning works. Like that should never be associated with power. But yet, in God's point of view, in God's perspective, like that's our example of what true power, you know, and true spirituality is, is looking at the cross. And he's saying through this illustration, basically, you know, ancient Israel, they didn't get it either. Um, this, this illustration taken out of Isaiah 29, um, it's a period of time where they think they know it's spiritual. It's observing feasts, it's giving eloquent speeches, it's following human rules, and that's what makes them spiritual. And God says, like, you're going to, your society is going to be destroyed if you follow down that track. And eventually it is. Uh, there's, uh, first of all, Syrian Empire attacks Israel, and then the Babylonian Empire, Empire attacks Israel, and many of them are deported to other places, um, and their life and their society is completely upended. Um, because you know, they thought they were pursuing spirituality, but they were really pursuing humans' idea of spirituality and, and hu humanity's idea of what um, success and status was, not the humble, justice-filled service, love that the cross teaches. And so he says, that's, that's where you need to go back to. And so as we look at all these different things, uh, the different issues that the Corinth church was trying to navigate, that Paul's trying to advise them on, everything is going to tie back to this idea of the cross. Like, here's the way that you think, but in the cross we find that the polar opposite is true. And so just keep that in mind as we work through it. Today we're looking at, you know, superiority and status and how we compare ourselves with each other, even secretly, to feel a little bit better than that person in the row next to us. Um, but it creates division. And in the next weeks, we'll be dealing with totally different things, lots of different issues, um, but all of which were relevant for them and we'll try to make them relevant for us as well. 